Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lulu. Hello, Lulu. Hello. I'm very excited for today's stories. Um... You know, sometimes uh, certain ones scare me more more than others, mm-hmm. and one of them is just um, such a nightmare. Oh. So obviously terrible for whoever it may have happened to, but um, good for horror fans. Okay. A uh, couple quick announcements first, though. Okay. I'd like to announce that my garlic breath is out of control. I can't. You're I far can enough away. It. I can't. I can't smell it. <laughs> uh, new undead tea hitting the Bad Magic Store this week. Cool looking zombie mummy creature on a black tea. Uh, Logan the Merch Wizard, our art warlock, uh, continuing to crush it in the horror tea game. If any podcast or store, horror website, whatever, has a better collection of horror merchandise, I don't know about it. <laughs> so you can, you can grab yours now at badmagicmerch.com. And I know you have our, our, our charity, uh, new charity now since we're into July as far as when this comes out. Happy July. I hope everyone had a happy and safe 4th of July. This month, we, uh, you know, we wanted to donate somewhere to the families and the victims of the families of the recent mass shootings as of this recording. I hate yeah. that I even have to say it that I way. I know. I know there's been a tremendous amount of them this year. Mm-hmm. In Uvalde and, um, and in New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, so w- with that said, you know, it was a real challenge to try and find a place. And and we couldn't pick between like one shooting being more important than the other. Yeah. It's like you, there's no decision to be made there. Uh, so we decided to donate to the National Compassion Fund. And their sole mission is to give funds to victims of mass, mass casualties, yeah. like mass shootings or terrorist attacks. Yeah. Um, you know, the world is full of so many awful things and they're just there to help when they can and to help as many people as they can. Uh, our donation amount is still to be determined because as you know, if you've been following along, we record ahead of time. So we will fill you in on the amount once we have it. But in the meantime, if you'd like to donate or learn more, please visit nationalcompassion.org. Yeah, what a great organization. Yeah, it's really like very, uh, I was I always look it up on Charity Navigator. Mm-hmm. And only, I know there are other charities that do it differently. But in the world of donations, they only use 18% of the money that comes in to pay like staff mm-hmm. and resources. And the rest of it goes to... The people who need it, which I think is really, really amazing. Yep. A lot of, lot of good people out there. We're so glad that uh, we can help donate. Thanks to the contributions of the Roberts and Annabelles. And uh, yeah, we have a, we have a very lucky to have great fans. We, we are. Uh, okay. So how much? Now you have one story you said? I have one. One longer story. Big old juicy tale. Okay. Oh, yeah, you want me to talk yeah, about yeah, it? Yeah, you can talk about it all. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's it. Get ready for your hamburger. Uh, yeah, just, just a maybe like a, a, a curse from a family member upon another family member okay. that trickles down over the years. But like, this is so random, but weaved into a game of hide and seek. Oh, interesting. It's like a very, it's a little twisty turvy up top. And then as yeah. you really get into the meat of it, you're like, oh, that would be terrifying to be hiding and to see that. Mm, there's been that, that's, that's been used in horror movies. I can't remember which one. I, I, I think the a, movie is hide and seek. But I think, but it showed up in other horror movies too. I want to say like others, or I don't know. But but just that concept mm-hmm. is truly terrifying. Of like, and, you know, and we've talked about it here on in some of the stories. There was mm-hmm. at least one. It might have been um one of those that you hate, the Victorian, the British Victorian stories. Maybe the Smee. puppy to sleep stories. <laughs> yeah, that maybe Smee, where like a ghost shows up in a game of hide and seek. Mm-hmm. You know what we said uh, last week or a couple weeks ago is like the um, escape room thing. We we're like mm-hmm. that should be a premise for a movie. Apparently it is. Thanks for all the email. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> like, cool. like more than one. So I guess we're just out of touch. Well, there's so many movies. It's hard to keep I track. I know. Of you guys understand. We're doing our best. Um, what did you mean by hamburger? By the way, at the beginning you said like grab a hamburger. I was like, what? Because I said this is gonna be nice and juicy. Oh. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right. man. Okay, I are ha- you old? Like, is your brain starting to not fire rapidly? I guess. I I have two horror stories. Um, the first is about our labradoodles, Penny Pooper, Gingerbell. Yeah, yeah. I know. I probably should have said something before today's recording, 
but they have been possessed by demons earlier today after no. a failed exorcism. I had to put them down. No. I, you know how I know that's not true? Why? I took them to puppy daycare today. <laughs> no. Uh, fur babies are okay. Um, uh, I have two stories. First is both terrifying and sad. Hmm. If the story posted online by an anonymous person is true, residents at a senior center. Oh, come on. For people with dementia uh, and related ailments are being preyed on by a monster or monsters. We've had something. We had a single person mm-hmm. in their home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It like didn't a remind home care me of that. Like a home care. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Uh, as if they didn't have enough to deal with already, obviously. Uh, don't want to give away more details than that. So a very intense claim of recent encounters. Second story, more traditional, the lore that surrounds a haunted hotel in Charleston, South Carolina, the Battery Carriage House Inn. That already sounds scary. Just the name, Battery Carriage. Yeah. Uh, we'll go over the history of this beautiful and historic structure and then share reports of some of its rooms that seem to be clearly haunted. Uh, let's check in on your sock status and then away well, we go. Thank you. Okay. I'm doing the careful mm-hmm. because of the dress. So now these socks I have a little, um, oh, there he is. There he is. Little I just heard your guy. stomach. A sloth guy. It's Bigfoot, you dingling. Oh, okay. Look like a sloth guy from where I was. Oh, boy. I, they, they, these were socks for you that I stole before giving to you. <laughs> a fan sent them in. I was like, I'll have those. Thank you. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, thank you for whoever gave those to us. I appreciate it. Thank you for the sloth Bigfoot socks. <laughs> um, so not much setup at all in this one. We're going to jump in pretty quick. Okay, I'm going to get snuggly duck. What? I'm going to get snuggled up. There we go. Uh, snuggly duck. <laughs> The the following was posted on March 19th, 2021. Staying anonymous for this one. I'm still working at the same elderly memory care assisted living facility where this all happened. As crazy as it sounds, it's all 100% true. Not sure for how much longer I'll be working there, though. I'm still just trying to keep everyone else from dying. Just not sure how I make the owners understand how important it is to keep anyone else from staying in room 132. Time now for the tale of death comes to room 132. I started working there a little over a year ago, right before COVID hit. I work as a resident assistant while I take classes part-time to become a registered nurse. I'm almost there course-wise, but once I get my degree, even though the pay will be so much better, I'm not sure I'll be able to leave until I figure out how to stop them. If you can stop them or stop him. I'm still not sure if it's just one or multiple of these monsters. There has to be a way though. There just has to be. The job description of a resident assistant can vary a lot from place to place. Basically, I check the vitals of patients in my section here and there. I keep a somewhat detailed record of how they're doing each shift. How lucid do they seem? Do they remember me? What's their mood like? Do they seem especially depressed or anxious? How are they eating, sleeping? Who's visiting them? I also help some patients use the bathroom and clean themselves. And I help most of them keep their places clean so they feel good about where they're staying. At least when they seem to know where they're staying. And I do whatever else just needs doing, really. All of our patients are, of course, in their later years, and all have some type of memory issue or issues, Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. And very few of them generally live long, uh, live a long time once they've made it to us. Usually their families take care of them until that just isn't feasible anymore. It's rare for anyone to stay for more than three years, and very rare, completely unheard of actually, for back-to-back-to-back-to-back residents to die in the same room in the same year. That's exactly what happened to four consecutive residents of room 132. To keep their names confidential, I'll just identify them by the first letters of their last names. Mr. B was the first to go. He was living there for over two years when I got the job. Great guy. When he was lucid, he was so funny. Sarcastic. First thing he ever said to me was, are you the new guy? And when I said I was, he said, good, good. You don't seem quite as stupid as the last guy. (laughs) And you're almost not as ugly. Then he laughed this big hearty laugh off my shocked reaction, slapped me on the shoulder, and I laughed too. I was surprised he knew I was a new guy. Well, he didn't. He said the same thing to me the next day and the day after that. Not every day, though. Sometimes it was like his dementia faded and he was his old self again. Those were the toughest days. The days he could remember when he knew why he was uh, where he was and who he had been before. He could still be really funny in moments, but overall his spirits were down on those days. I was only there about a month when he died. Natural causes, they said. Just passed away in his sleep. His heart stopped beating. Now I know... That wasn't the whole story. And now I have guilt whenever I think about him dying. He tried to tell me something was wrong, but I wasn't there long enough to understand that yet. A couple nights before he died, I worked, and still work, the swing shift. He said a boy tried to get into his room. Said a boy with dark eyes, all black eyes, knocked on his window and asked to be let in. No! Asked for permission to come in, to be specific. I believe that was how he phrased it. 
Mr. B was pretty lucid that day, and he said he told the boy, who he thought might be his grandson at first, but then realized he didn't recognize him, to go around to the lobby and ask someone there to let him in. And the boy got angry, shot him a cold stare, spooked him, demanded to be invited in. Mr. B shut the curtains on him and pressed the buzzer for me to check on him. When he told me the story, I was positive it was just his dementia. Mm. I told him we'd check outside and see what was going on, but we didn't. I didn't even tell anyone. It all sounded so crazy. Not a part of me thought what he said could be real at that moment. I was off the next few nights. Then when I came back to work, I was informed that he'd passed away sometime the night before, natural causes. And I wouldn't have ever doubted that it was natural causes except for one odd detail. His window, which he always kept closed in my experience, had been left open. When I heard that, it made me think about what he spoke of the last time we talked. Now I think that thing came back for him. And when it came back, maybe his mind wasn't as sharp as it was the first time. Maybe now he did think it was his grandson. But at that time, that possibility felt too crazy. It wasn't even a possibility in my mind. I wrote the window being open, off as a coincidence. And the story about the boy was nothing more than dementia. His room stayed empty for about a month after he passed. And then Mrs. K moved in. Mrs. K was old, very old, even for our center, in her mid-90s. When she died about six weeks after moving in, no one batted an eye, including me. Not really. She was polite, but she never said much. She always seemed confused. No lucid moments. She barely spoke. She even had trouble moving around. She never seemed scared or anything before she passed, so I had no reason to link her death to Mr. B's, except her window had also been found open. And I also couldn't recall her ever opening it before. She might have died towards the end of my shift, but no one found out until the following shift. Again, natural causes. Now, of course, I don't think there was anything natural about it. Room 132 stayed open for almost three months after that. A lot of people were reluctant to put their parents or grandparents in homes like ours thanks to COVID, and we had more vacancy than normal. But then Mrs. G moved in. She was a lot younger, in her early 70s, and her dementia wasn't nearly as advanced as Mrs. K or Mr. B's. She mostly moved into our center because she didn't have anyone to take care of her. I expected her to live another two, three years at least, but she didn't last three weeks. No warning signs with her either before she died, and now I'm not surprised. She was a very sweet, kind woman, and she loved children. She talked about her own grandchildren a lot who lived across the country. If some child came to her window and asked if they could come in, I have no doubt she wouldn't have hesitated to give them permission. And I think that's exactly what happened. Heart attack was listed as the cause of death this time around. And yes, that damn window was found open. Mrs. G would open the window quite often, so no one was really worried about a pattern yet, except for me. But even I didn't raise any kind of fuss. You have to understand, this facility has over 130 patients at any given time. Death is frequent. Death is expected. So while yes, people are dying in room 132, people are also dying all over the rest of the facility. Room 132 now sat vacant almost two months, until Mr. S moved in. He'd live longer, he'd make it over 10 weeks. His dementia was pretty advanced, but like Mr. B, he'd have moments where he knew exactly what was going on, and some of the things he said scared the hell out of me. Mr. S was almost always a grumpy guy, and when he was more lucid, he was often an angry guy. He was mad at his kids for not taking care of him, mad at us for not letting him leave, mad at the world for having the brain he couldn't trust. One night, when he'd been there for about a month, I heard him talking to himself when I was tidying up his room. Goddamn kid, he barked. Tried it again last night, little thug ain't crawling into my room. Lucky, lucky I don't have any of my guns. I'd scare him good. Kid or not, I'd shoot that little prick if he tried climbing in my window. Little bastard yelled at me. I should have let him in and wrung his scrawny neck. Everything okay, Mr. S? I asked, having some trouble. Nothing I can't handle, he snapped. Not some helpless little baby like all you people think I am. I, I, I don't think that, I started to say. Get out, he yelled now. Get out of my room. Not wanting him to get any more worked up, I left. But then I couldn't stop thinking about what he said. I wanted to try and ask him about it again to warn him to make sure he didn't let anyone in. But then he went through a pretty rough spell of being very, very confused. It lasted for a little over a month. During that time, I never heard him mention any kids outside his window again, and I never saw his window open. I also talked to a supervisor about security. The supervisor assured me that the facility had security cameras all around the building and that there was nothing to worry about. I asked if he could check the footage taken outside of the room 132 the night before I heard Mr. S grumbling, and he said, sure, I can have someone look it over. But he said it too quick. I knew immediately he wasn't going to have anyone check on anything. He was just placating me. And then I heard Mr. S say something else that scared me. When I came into his room one night to check on him, I heard him yell right before I walked in, Go away! He sounded frightened. 
And when I opened the door, I thought I saw a flicker of movement right outside his window. That goddamn boy, he yelled. He keeps coming back. I don't like him. I don't like his eyes. Tell whoever owns this goddamn place to make sure he doesn't come back. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him, I assured Mr. S. Tell him now, he yelled. My nurse heard him scream at me, and when she came in, he got even more worked up. He ended up pushing her pretty hard into the wall. I had to help restrain him, and another resident assistant came over to help as well. We ended up sedating him that night. And then when it wore off, he was gone again, lost inside his broken mind. And then a week later, he was dead. Some very unnatural natural causes had struck once again, and of course, the window had been left open. The nurse, nurse who worked the same shift as me, generally checked on the same patients, thought this was spooky too. At least I wasn't alone. But she didn't think any strange child was actually killing anyone. She just thought it was weird. Maybe it's a ghost, she wondered before laughing. I didn't laugh. I got the chills when she said that. Maybe it was a ghost, a bad one. Or maybe it was something worse than a ghost. Four dead patients now in just under a year. And two, shortly before they died, reported seeing a child outside their window who wanted to be let in not long before passing away. And all four, all four, had their windows open the night they died. Mr. C still lives in 132 as I write this. And if any part of me still doubted some strange monster being behind these desks before he moved in, no part of me doubted any longer after a few of the things he told me. And then I saw for myself. Mr. C's on the older side. He's 88, but he's more lucid than any of 132's previous residents. He doesn't move around real well, but his mind is one of the sharper ones I've ever seen. And just a week after he moved in, never having heard stories about what the previous occupants of room 132 had witnessed, he described the same monster that Mr. B described to me a year earlier. He said a boy with dark eyes, all black eyes, had knocked on his window and asked for permission to be let in. And this boy immediately frightened Mr. C. He doesn't have any grandkids. He knew right away there was something wrong with this kid. He knew that this thing wasn't really a kid. He told this thing to get the hell away from his window before he called the police. And just like with Mr. B, this thing got angry, screamed for him to be let in. No, Mr. B said he yelled, get out of here. And then he hit the buzzer to have someone come to his room. And I answered that call. He was so scared when I showed up. He was shaking. He told me this thing sped, sped away right when the door opened, sped away with impossible speed. And he told me that after he yelled this thing to leave the last time, it sort of hissed at him, that it bared its teeth, or fangs rather. I didn't tell him about the four previous residents. I didn't want to scare him further. I just told him to never, ever let that thing in. And I said the next time he saw it, not to yell at it to leave. Instead, quietly press the buzzer for someone to come to his room. I hoped I could finally get a look at this thing, or someone could. I also decided that I'd start spending more time in the room with Mr. C. There was a chair against the same wall as the window that I could sit on where no one outside would see me. I hoped that maybe I'd get lucky, or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, and I'd see this monster for myself and be able to do more to stop it. About a week later, that's exactly what happened. In between what I just told you and what I'm about to tell you, Mr. C had another encounter when no one else was around. He hit the buzzer, but I wasn't on duty, and someone else moseyed over to his room and slowly opened the door, didn't see anything, and of course didn't believe what he said he saw. But I believed him when he told me. And two nights later, I was able to camp out in his room, sitting on the chair by the wall, for just long enough to see that horrible thing with my own eyes. It was almost 10.30 p.m. I could only stay with Mr. C a few more minutes before making my rounds one last time before I needed to clock out. We were trying to keep things light, talking about basketball. He's a big Lakers fan. He was talking about how strange it was to watch games with almost no one in the stands, only virtual seats, video monitors of fans in the stands watching the game from somewhere else. He was worried the Lakers weren't going to reach the playoffs. And of course, he was a lot more worried about the boy outside the window. And then that boy showed up. He didn't seem to approach slowly, gauging by Mr. C's reaction. He wasn't there one moment. And then the next moment, he was standing about a foot beyond the glass. When Mr. C locked eyes with this thing, I slowly and quietly twisted around in my seat, then quickly slid out of my seat so I could at least hopefully catch a glimpse of this thing before it vanished. I ended up getting a lot more than a glimpse. As soon as I moved to where I could look out the window, I saw it or him or whatever it is. If you just glance quick, you'd see a normal looking boy, maybe 11 or 12, somewhere around 5'2", five, 5'3", five, maybe 100 pounds, dark brown hair cut short, plain white t-shirt and blue jeans, pale complexion. But if you stared longer, you'd notice this was no normal boy at all. His eyes, its eyes, were jet black, literally no white at all. And its skin, so unnaturally blemish-free, no moles, freckles, scars, nothing. And just a tad more pale than I've ever seen on a real person. In a millisecond after I saw it, it saw me. And it asked, slash demanded, let me in. And that's when I saw its teeth. It had fangs, predatory, not like human teeth, like shark-like. And its gaze, when it locked eyes with you, was hypnotic. 
After all my concerns, knowing what I knew, when it gazed into my eyes, asked me to let it in, just for a moment, I considered it. Luckily, I shook it off, called my supervisor, who answered the phone after the first ring. There's someone trying to break into room 132, the window, right now. We need to get security out here immediately. Security was called, but they didn't make it to the little patch of trees outside of Mr. C's room in time. They made it in under two minutes, but it wasn't fast enough. After I hung up my phone, this thing screamed, Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! It felt like its last scream shook the window. It was so loud. But when I asked around later, no one else remembered hearing it. And then it just vanished in a blur, just shot off into the woods before the security guard got there. I now told Mr. C what had happened to the previous four occupants of the room. I told him he'd be okay. He just had to make sure he never, ever invited this thing in. I assured him I'd work on getting him transferred to another room, have this room blocked off from use as soon as possible. That was a few weeks ago, but he's still there. And the other rooms are still full. After the security guard didn't see anything, or even come across any signs of anyone having been out there, I asked to look at the security footage. And it showed nothing. According to the footage, that thing outside the window screaming at us existed only in our minds. My supervisor was not happy with me. Mr. C was incredibly worked up, and he thought it was my fault that I was enabling his delusions. The next day, Mr. C told his daughter about what had happened, and she too was extremely upset. She also thought I'd gotten her dad all worked up over something that was crazy, and she thought I was crazy. I came real close to getting fired. So now what do I do? I've done a lot of online research, and I think this is one of those black-eyed children, also called black-eyed kids. They resemble children, but they're definitely not kids. Some think they're aliens, others think they're demonic, maybe vampires of some sort. No one really seems to know much for certain. Other than not inviting them in, no one seems to know how to protect yourself from them. The lack of information is pretty disappointing and upsetting. Worst of all, I can't find a single other story where one of them keeps coming back to the same address, or in this case, the same room within an address, over and over and over again. I also can't find a story of them seeming to kill people. They usually tend to just fill people with a sense of dread, make people worry about being killed. But this black-eyed kid, it's almost like it's feeding on residents of 132. Why? Why keep coming back to the exact same room? There are so many other rooms and residents it could prey on. What does it want? How do I stop it? How do I protect Mr. C? I'll post again if I can somehow figure anything out. In the meantime, I'll just keep working here. I'll keep checking on Mr. C as much as I can. I'll keep reminding him to never, ever invite this thing in. And I'll just hope, I guess, that his mind holds up for long enough to have him stay alive until I can figure something out. And that's the end of this resident's assistance post. Let's hope over the last 15 months, they've been able to keep Mr. C safe. Let's hope they found the solution they were looking for and share it soon. Heek. Is that the one before the show that you were talking about that really freaked you out? Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I mean, what a like weird combination Mm -hmm. of things of like memory clinic and then seeing a black eyed kid. Yeah. And so lucky that the RA saw saw it as well so that it wouldn't just be written off. I mean, I guess. Kind of. Kind of. It's like now there's just. (sighs) I know. But doesn't it feel good when you think that you've seen something that at least one other person can verify it? Yes, yes. But it's so tragic for the person working there, you know, that uh, if you were to see this thing and now you know, but like you can't get anyone else to believe you and you know it's a ticking clock. Mm -hmm. Like this person's mind is fading. Eventually they're going to let this thing in. (sighs) Okay, but I was thinking like a couple of things. Locks on the window. Hello. Yeah, but he can't like if that's not their. um, Oh, no one's checking. (laughs) <laughs> they're so busy taking care of people. They're not going to be like checking all the windows to make sure they have or have or don't have a lock on them. Like something special to like, I don't know. Probably some fire code violation, but yeah. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I would fucking take Gorilla Glue and glue the lock mm, shut. I don't know. Mm, yeah. But, like fire code violation, who fucking cares? This is an old person who's not going to climb out that window to save themselves in a fire anyways. Right, right, There's right. There's going to be a staff of people that are going to wheelchair you out or. Break you know, the window or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could do that. Yeah. I had that thought. Curtains? Like, why can't we just, like, pull curtains across the windows? Just so you don't have to see the thing. Because mm. I think... But then, if, but, then, but again, if you're not thinking correctly, you would forget why the curtains are closed. And mm-hmm. you just go open them. But this RA, when the RA is working, yeah. they, could, they could put it in the person's chart that Mr. C likes the curtains closed every night. Huh? And if you yeah. don't close them, he'll really lose it. He'll go out like it really upsets him. It really, you yeah, know, causes yeah. a kerfuffle. Like you could, I feel like you could come up. I'm not saying that that is like the perfect or permanent solution, but. Right. Ooh-wee. Uh, no picks for a, a company this story, but I did, I mean, I did find uh, a no, pick of a, of a black eyed child. We haven't seen attached to one of these stories before, just on the web. Just reminding me of this story. I'm refusing to look. 
Oh, yeah, you are. And then oh, this, God. And then there's another one, another random pick of a black-eyed boy. This one's screaming. Now, imagine this thing, but looking a little older with fangs. I know the fangs. Now, that's a detail I don't think I've ever heard before about black-eyed children. I don't think so children. either. Yeah, like little, yeah. And then and this, this next one, this is just uh, silly. It's just somebody up turned a, a picture of Justin Bieber into a black-eyed child. Okay. Oh, the, the Biebs not doing great right now. I know, poor guy is uh, some kind of um, uh, viral infection that paralyzed part of his face. I, I did actually, I was curious and looked into it. Mm -hmm. In all likelihood, he'll fully recover. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It's just um, frustrating. Frustrating. I'm sure. Yeah, and like he, I, so not that I know a lot about the Biebs, but yeah. it like came across my news feed that, you know, he was having like a hard time eating because <sighs> of the paralyzation. He's already like a thin dude. I mean, healthy. Yeah. You know, but I'm just like, oh my gosh, like protein shakes. He's going to be emaciated and uh, they'll fill in for the protein shakes or something. Yeah. But maybe. It sucks. Oh man, so weird. Okay, lock the windows, curtains. How do we protect them? It keeps coming back. I thought that that was okay. So the fangs, that was a new detail that I hadn't heard about black eyed children yeah. before. And then also, uh, that it kept coming back to the exact same spot every yeah, like, time. Like fixated on this particular little like um, geographical point. Yeah, and I wonder why. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, maybe I almost think of like a loop. Mm, like something oh, yeah. popping Just out of stuck. the same portal or something over and over and over again. I don't know. I don't know, but that is, ooh, that is so uncomfortable. Yeah. And it is so sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, like memory care clinics are so sad to begin with. Yeah, yeah, and then to add a level of terror to it. I know, like one of the guys when you're talking about, you know, that he would have these lucid moments and then just be so mad that he couldn't trust his brain. Uh -huh. Such a horrible, horrible, horrible way to go. Yeah. I feel like I read an article somewhat recently about Alzheimer's testing for the markers for it, that they might be able, that they are maybe making progress in being able to figure out if you have the markers for it. And then I would assume, I'm not a scientist, but I would assume that if they can figure that out, then they can reverse engineer it as to like possibly different kinds of treatments and stuff or preventatives. I hope so. Yeah. Happy. Go scientists, go. I know. Come on, science. <laughs> it's a particularly awful one. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, so upsetting. Okay, so now it is time for us to leave the world of Black Eyed Kids lore, oh, if you're you. ready. Uh, and oh, hear, I'm ready, buddy. Hear about another haunted hotel. How many supposed haunted hotels are there in just the U.S.? Like, what, 200, 300 more? It seems like it's endless. I feel like 1,500. <laughs> now for a story with a lot of setup before we get into the scares. Too much interesting history not to share it. It isn't hard to see how a city like Charleston could quickly gain a reputation for being haunted. The city's long history, combined with its atmosphere of gently swaying Spanish moss and the fog that rolls in from the harbor, could lead more than one person to think that they'd seen something from the other side. There's also the bloodshed. Charleston saw a lot of carnage during the Civil War, steep in the area in blood and conflict. In fact, it was the bombardment of Fort Sumner in Charleston Harbor by Confederate forces that started the Civil War. Although there were no casualties during that particular bombardment, one Union artillerist was killed and three wounded, one mortally, when a cannon exploded prematurely while firing a salute during the evacuation on April 14th. And many think that numerous historic buildings of Charleston, those old southern estates and their intricate wrought iron balconies and ornate facades, are home to more than just living occupants. But one hotel may stand alone amongst the many haunted places in Charleston as being home to the most active of the area's spirits. Time now for the tale of the many lives of Charleston's Battery Carriage House Inn. The hotel's history began on June 7th, 1843, when the land where the hotel would one day be built was purchased by Samuel N. Stevens for $4,500. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Stevens was a wealthy businessman who acted as a commercial agent for farmers. He'd made a small fortune lending money to cover unforeseen expenses from poor rainfall or lack of transportation. Originally built as a private residence, the main home and carriage house reflected the prosperity that was not unique to Samuel Stevens, but was prevalent in South Carolina during this era. The large single home was one room deep with a hall behind the rooms on each floor and the length faced the sea instead of the street, as was custom to allow more light and air in. Stevens' home was almost lost during a siege of Charleston in 1863, but survived. Stevens wouldn't maintain ownership much longer, but the house at least still stood. When Colonel Lathers of the Union Army purchased the property in 1870, he hired John Henry Devereux, a well-known Charleston architect, to renovate the house in the popular New York style. A mansard roof was added, which housed the library. A new ballroom was also constructed, but not for dancing. Instead, the ballroom became a conference room that would be used by senators, dignitaries, affluent business leaders. Just four years after moving in, and four years of not exactly being made to feel welcome in the city, Colonel Lathers 
the, uh, the northern aggressor sold the property to the Simmons family who lived in the house until 1912. Eight years later, the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings, now the Preservation Society of Charleston, and the oldest preservation society in the nation formed in the building's ballroom. Same year, beginning with the conversion of the rear outbuilding into a motor court, the building began its transformation from a private residence to a hotel. Signs on major roads entering Charleston soon advertised its newly rentable rooms, and the hotel's main body of patronage soon became made up of primarily rowdy, carousing sailors from the U.S. Navy. In the 1960s, the building's usage would change yet again when the hotel's rooms were converted to small apartments, rented to college students. Then in the 1980s, aided by, aided by a local push to preserve historic buildings, the property at 20 South Battery was once again restored for use as a hotel. Drayton Hasty and his wife purchased the property and oversaw renovations. Using the main house as a private residence, the Hasties opened the aptly named Battery Carriage House Inn with rooms available to guests in the carriage house. And the Hasties would begin to uncover the darker side of local history that the Battery Inn was a part of or a witness to. For starters, the property once had a first row seat for public hangings Ugh. that took place in the beautiful park only steps away at the White Point Garden. Now one of the prettiest and most well-known green spaces in downtown Charleston, White Point Garden offers shady paths covered in canopies of Spanish moss-covered old oak trees. But some of those same trees once had freshly dead bodies hanging beneath them. Thirty of those bodies belonged to a band of pirates led by Steed Bonnet, and one of the bodies was Bonnet's. Steed, nicknamed the Gentleman Pirate, wasn't born into a life of crime. The son of a wealthy English family on the island of Barbados, Bonnet had led a fairly successful life in his late teens and early and mid-twenties, which enabled him to buy his way into piracy. It was the usual custom for pirates to begin their work by seizing a ship that they had then used to prey on other ships. Bonnet, however, bought his ship, the Revenge. He also hired his crew, paid them regular wages. After terrorizing some ships on the Virginia coast, Bonnet sailed for the pirate's paradise of Nassau in the Bahamas. There he would battle Colonel Rhett. After a night of maneuvering stoops back and forth to gain advantage in battle, the sun rose on the morning of September 27, 1718. All four battling ships ran aground. But then the rising tide eventually freed Rhett's vessel, while Bonnet's stoop, the Royal James, remained stuck. The Royal James was quickly boarded by Rhett's men who outnumbered the pirates. In a last-ditch effort, Bonnet ordered his gunner to blow up the ship's powder stores, but this suicidal act was prevented by Bonnet's men, who disobeyed the orders of their captain and surrendered. They weren't willing to go down with the ship. Rhett then returned triumphantly to Charleston with Bonnet and 29 of his men in chains. Bonnet and his men were put on trial before Vice Admiralty Judge Nicholas Trott and found guilty. Bonnet and the men were then hanged at White Point, their bodies left dangling from the gallows for an unknown period of time, long enough for their decaying corpses to become bloated before being cut down and unceremoniously dumped into the nearby mash, marsh, <laughs> where they were eaten by crabs, riddled with maggots, and pecked by gulls. Over the course of the following five weeks, 49 more pirates would swing from the gallows at White Point. Within a couple months, 20 more met the same fate. In addition to all the pirates, scores of slaves were also hanged as well. And at least two people were gibbeted, a particularly cruel form of showcasing the dead. Gibbeting was more commonly used in England, but made its way across the Atlantic to Charleston. The practice of gibbeting involved hanging the dead body in a cage-like metal encasement and leaving it there to decay. Yeah. Occasionally, the gibbet was also used as a method of execution, the criminal being left to die of exposure, thirst, or starvation in full public view. In some cases, the bodies would then be left until their clothes started to rot, even until the bodies completely decomposed, turned to skeletons, and then the bones would be scattered. Comes as no surprise, then, that many reports of hauntings have come from White Point Garden. Some locals say that if one looks out on the bay from the foot of Walter Street, where Vanderhorst Creek once met the waters of the Cooper River, when the moon is high, they can see the bloated faces of the long-dead pirates just under the water's surface. But the most terrifying spirits are the ones who don't seem to lie beneath the surface. They come for you. They're the spirits that haunt the Battery House Carriage Inn. Let's begin with room number three. One autumn, a couple arrived to stay in Battery Inn's room number three. They were excited for a weekend of sightseeing, a little alone time, and the chance to get a little rest and relaxation before returning home. Unfortunately, they wouldn't get any of that. On the first night, they both woke up to find that the man's cell phone was making strange sounds, not the normal sounds of a call or a notification, but something more akin to an amber alert or urgent weather notification, but not quite that either. The phone was blaring. The couple both squinted in the darkness, trying to get their bearings, hoping to figure out how to make the noise stop, when they thought they saw a mysterious orb of light quickly disappear into the bathroom. The man now went to turn his phone completely off, remembering later that he had his phone had run out of battery that day and he hadn't plugged it back into charge. 
The next night, wondering if it was some kind of glitch, the couple made sure to turn off the man's phone, stash it in the adjoining room, but at the same time, three o'clock in the morning, sharp, the phone started blaring again. Now when they opened their eyes, they were stunned to see not one, but several flashes of light darting around their room for the next several moments, before the noise stopped as the lights vanished. That day, the couple contacted a local medium, asked her to check out their room, and the medium reported that she felt the presence of not one, but several spirits. She asked the spirits to leave the room, and that night, the couple said they got their first night of sound sleep. But they still wondered if the spirits had indeed left the room, or if they just wanted people to think they'd left it. Now on to room number eight. While room three has been home to numerous strange encounters, the likes of which I just described, room eight is widely considered the most terrifying and most haunted of the inn's rooms. Multiple guests have reported going to sleep after a long day, only to hear disturbing moaning noises, sounding like they're coming from within the mattress. Then when they open their eyes, they report seeing a floating headless torso, bleeding from many wounds. One guest, a skeptical man who knowingly booked room eight out of sheer disbelief, said he saw that headless torso and even tried to touch it when somehow the figure let out a low growl. The man gathered up his things immediately, checked out that night, went to stay at a motel along a nearby highway. And there are other supposedly haunted rooms. The entity that inhabits room number 10 is considered to be the friendly spirit, but maybe too friendly for a lot of guest comfort. The gentleman ghost, as he's called, is reportedly the apparition of an average looking man who glides around the room in the early hours of the morning. Some guests claim that he's done more than float by them, and that maybe he's not such a gentleman. They reported waking up to feeling a distinct pressure on the other side of the bed. Most of these guests assume it's their partner or spouse and snuggle in only to then find those same partners emerge from the bathroom or the hallway. At that point, the gentleman ghost lying next to them vanishes. Finally, a concierge recalled an amateur ghost hunter who came to stay in room number 10 a few years ago and got more than they were hoping for. The ghost hunter, a young man, had a thermal camera that he set up in the room, and this ghost hunter later showed the concierge two videos and she supposedly would wish that she had never seen them. In the first video, some kind of shadowy stick figure, shape entity, touches and then stands on top of the ghost hunter's wife's head while she's lying in bed. In the second video, the stick figure thing is sitting in a chair along the back wall. After several seconds, it jumps to the window, appears to hang onto the curtains for several more seconds before then disappearing. What the hell is it? You can investigate any of these rooms to try and find out for yourself if you want to. Just hope that the ghosts at the Battery Carriage House Inn don't check out with you when you leave. Standing on her head? I know, like, I, I wanted to find that video. Of course, I like, I couldn't find it, but I'm like, come on. Why isn't that thing out there somewhere? It's so amusing. I know. What a weird little, like, stick figure thing, like, around there. I mean, if you saw a little stick figure guy standing on my head, what would you do? You know, it is funny, like, that, that that specific image, if it was like a little stick figure guy, doesn't seem menacing. Not at all. I was just, I assumed that you would say that you would laugh. Yeah, I, I'd be, I don't know. I'd be weirded out, but I mean, depending on, like, the energy, I guess, I might laugh. Like, what? Yeah, yeah. Room number eight doesn't sound great. The mm -hmm. moaning from the mattress? Yeah, like, from within the mattress is very disturbing. I had this very inappropriate inappropriate thought of like a couple stays in room number eight they're having their intimate moments yeah, yeah, yeah. there's moaning but then there's an extra moan <laughs> it's like we didn't you're, invite, you're, we didn't invite like, anybody else like hold on a second that wasn't you and that wasn't right? me and then like floating torso it's like ah oh my god threesome with a floating torso <laughs> goes, oh. goes threesome oh, oh. what a weird weird thing i know i do like the variety of sometimes it's like yeah there's been a million like haunted hotel stories sure but then you like come across new little like little stick figure thingy i know or, what's that or like moaning from within a mattress i've like never heard that detail before uh mm -hmm. i do have some photos mm -hmm. this first one it, this is a beautiful place this is the battery carriage house in gosh dang oh my heck <laughs> i've never been to south carolina i've only i've i did a couple college shows there years ago but i've spent very little time there we were just we were just having lunch with a south carolinian I know. Yeah, Olivia is. Maybe she's. Maybe she's been there. Maybe she's a ghost. Maybe she's a ghost. Maybe she's. <gasps> oh outside. my god, Olivia Lee is not real. <laughs> uh, this next one's a pick of room number eight. The room the headless torso has been spotted in. That oh, it looks nice. That reminds me of. Oh gosh, that's the mattress, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that looks similar to the Peter and Paul Hotel in New Orleans. Oh yeah, you've been there, but not me. Uh, it's a great hotel. Ah. Great, great, great hotel, and one of my favorite neighborhoods too. Uh, this next one, room 10, with that strange stick figure image, was supposedly picked up by a thermal camera, which I could find the supposed image, but again, yeah, um, it's, you know, if it's online, it doesn't pop up with any mm -hmm, keyword mm -hmm. searches you would think would show it. 
It's already a little bit uncomfortable just looking out those window- windows with the Spanish moss trees. Uh huh, right there. It's a little like you can just imagine if it was dark and there's yeah. light filtering in. You can like a little breeze moving things around. Yeah, you can picture little reflections that you would see there or otherwise. Yeah, images. Uh, this next picture, it's just a recreation of that practice of gibbeting. <gasps> oh. Sometimes- now there's variations. Sometimes it would be like that where there's chains all around the person's body that they, they, they're immobile. Mm-hmm. In other ones, it was like this. It would be like a contraption, like a hangman's kind of like that gallows thing, like if you're playing the little hangman game. Mm-hmm. But where the noose would drop down, it would support a full cage, like, like a like a dog kennel kind of thing. That's what I was thinking, like yeah. a big square cage. Mm-hmm. Not- there's, there's variations, but there's that or the cage. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't thinking of a cage approximately. Yeah person sized i just think what an absolutely terrible way to go where you're suspended out there you're in public there's all these people who could help you but like are you know obviously not allowed to you've well done they're, not going, ter- to they're because... not going to because they're not going to like they don't want to end up in the cage and you've probably done something terrible mm-hmm. but but then like just to be up there and no food no water and just like exposure oh what a crazy way to go so cruel and unusual yeah, yeah, cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, that's why they put that in the Constitution because it was uh, back in the 18th century. I know. When the Constitution they were out of drawn, control. It was, it was pretty common. And then this what last was, one. What was the one when you would be like execution style and they would tear you apart? Oh, um, I don't. Is that drawn like and st- quartered? Stretch. They would stretch. Well, there's the rack. You could be stretched on the rack. rack. But there, but there was one where they would um, literally tie. They get four horses. Yeah, drawn quarter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That is so crazy. Tie an arm to one horse, arm another arm to the other. Like, and then just have like somebody like make a loud noise, you know, and send all the horses running in different directions at the same time. Would it be pretty quick though? L- oh, like I don't the think death. So. Oh, well, oh, I don't think so actually, because you could have your arms and legs ripped off, and then you have to bleed out. That wouldn't kill you right away. Ooh. Ooh, I didn't think about that. I would, for some reason, I had you falling apart. This this isn't even logical. I had your like stomach ripping off with your arms and legs, so that you were just like bursting essentially, just like. I, I would think you would rip off. At the, <laughs> this is such a macabre, con- but it rip off at like the hip joints mm-hmm. or you know the shoulder joints. Right, but right. I'm not sure. And then you would just be some weird torso. Oh my god. My guess is that you would be in such shock. I don't know how much pain you would actually like. The pain would be yeah. pretty instant, but then so overwhelming. And then you'd bleed out pretty quick. Yeah, the weirdest thoughts. I mean, you you would you'd be like, oh, this isn't good. I'm not I'm not coming back for this. Uh uh-uh. uh. Crazy. And then one more. But, al- but also like pedophiles, rapists. Well, well, back then though, what was so frustrating is like. No, it, I'm not talking about that. Back then, I'm saying, oh, should we bring yeah, it back? If we did. Well, yeah. There's certain there's certain criminals where it's like, okay, I I might be up up for that for sure. Uh, but like, don't back, touch my daughter. Yeah, but back then it was like, um, you've been accused of witchcraft. You know, it's like I know. craziness. You were masturbating. <laughs> right. You're right. Uh, or we think you were. Um, uh, I know. We think that you seem a little too like you're glowing <laughs> and you're single and we know you, like, oh my God. Uh, and then this last, this last picture, this is an illustration, an old illustration of Steve Bonnet. Oh the, yeah. The gentleman pirate. I know. What an interesting thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Interesting where it's like, he didn't need to do it. He just clearly wanted to. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Maybe he wanted to reject his parents. Maybe. Maybe just loved pirating. Don't let Kyler know about him. <laughs> Don't reject us, buddy. <laughs> you can't take our money to buy pirate ships. <laughs> that would, yeah, that was, those were great. Uh, that first story. Creepy. So Sad. upsetting. Mm-hmm. Sad, creepy, scary. All the adjectives. Yeah. Wild, cool, interesting. interesting. Uh, I think it was particularly sticking with me too, that first one, because in my story, as you're about to find out, there was also a window thing. Like mm-hmm. seeing something in a window. Which is like, it, I mean, it is so scary because I just think about Okay, like we often work together, like we were last night. No, oh, it was nice. Yeah, it was uh, in, in the living room, and we're sitting there. Oh and, God! Please don't say this. I know, but it's just like, like you know, like with the windows and the, and the setup, it's like you can't face all of them. Mm-hmm. And man, I just like I would lose my shit if I was like in the swivel chair, and I th- think I heard something, a scratch, or just sense a presence, and then I picture turning around, and there's like the, the way our property layout is. The one window, like, you shouldn't be able to look in if you're standing just because of the way the the recess is. Yeah. So if there was, like, a little boy in that window, that means he's floating, too. Uh, Or he's very tall. (laughs) Or he's very tall. Like the eight-foot-tall woman. (sighs) Oh, Paul, Paul, Paul. Oh, man. But, uh, yeah, I would um, have a breakdown. Yeah, we have too many windows in this house. I've decided that in future houses, I want less windows. natural light, though. Less (laughs) windows. It's scary. Can be, yeah, at night. I know. That's why you have to keep all the curtains and blinds closed. I re- or, like, 
I don't like when they're open late at night. We'll just live. We'll just live in a big concrete house with like it'll only have like little turret, like little um, um, shooting holes with like <laughs> like uh, like uh, like an old fort. I'm with, in, I'm there <laughs> with like crazy automatic like like um like crazy industrial. I'm not telling you like military, but like not like a like like a rifle, but just yeah. like, like these big turrets. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll just have that, and we'll just live in some crazy bunker. You know, crazy thick concrete wall. <laughs> it'd be really good for my skin. <laughs> it is sad that some people do get so paranoid. I know. That they end up living in, not like that, quite, but like a Maybe. version of that. Running drills and, oh man. Well, I'm not going that far, but. Not go I full mean, prepper? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not scared. The prepper part doesn't, I'm like, oh, that, that actually, okay, you've got a plan, whatever. I'm worried about the things like the black eyed children. I'm not worried about the world coming to an end. Yeah, you are, because you hate the Purge movies. Oh, there is that. Yep. Those movies are so scary. Right, and that's why you'd want to live in the prepper fort because otherwise people, I know. people with masks and weapons are going to come destroy us. We have neighbors that in are the purge world. We have neighbors that are near preppers, so I think we'd be okay. They really ah, like us. They do like us, but is there enough of them? Is there enough of them? Yeah, because it's just a couple, one couple. No, they have children. I know, but they're not going to help defend them. I'm talking about like, is there enough people to like defend us from purge? Oh, oh no! I'm saying if there is a purge, we go to their house and we stay with them because they have everything we need. Maybe Arthur and I could just handle it. Handle it. Yeah. Okay. He's he's got a lot of stuff. He's got he's a lot practicing. of stuff. He's good with guns. He's, yeah, he's law enforcement. He probably got like some cool weapons. Yeah. He's at least he at least has a. He's gun. proficient. He's proficient. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes mm-hmm. he has a sweet mustache. I'll be his assistant. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We, we go there. That's yeah. where we start. And okay. then, like when when we think it's all clear, like during the daytime. Yeah. We make we haul ass to your mom's. <laughs> that is where we're safe. True. My my stepdad, yep, he's he's got a quite the arsenal. And also, no one's driving up there. And yeah, also there's a low population, no reason for people to go there. Yep, yep. I'm glad I'm glad we got this figured out. Okay, this is good. All right. You're invited. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All right. Do you have a squishy squishy over there? I do. I a got purple the, one. I got a purple one. I know. I love the Layla's, but I'm just like wondering if it if we need to like expand out. Oh, I can look at the box. There's other ones. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll put maybe some more thought into it. Some rotation. You right, know, maybe some fine. other guys. There's like, there's those white creamy ones that are, remind me of the man with no face or whatever. I'm picturing our listenership just completely dropping off specifically because of a lack of variety within squishies. Uh, I was picturing um, they stopped listening because you have ditched Layla and they're so emotionally attached to Layla that they're like, listen, you either bring Layla back or we're out. Yep. Like thousands and thousands of people just so angry mm-hmm. outside the studio. We want Layla. <laughs> we want Layla. Could you imagine? No. <laughs> but that so would be crazy. so funny. So, if, be anybody, so funny. if anybody wants to stage that, Flash I'm here mob. for it. Oh my God, it'd be so <laughs> funny. Other people in the building are like, what? who's Layla and what's happening? Oh, that'd be so great. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Just one big juicy hamburger tail. Okay. Let's get that, <laughs> let's get that burger. Let's get let's burger get that, cooked up. Let's get that burger, bro. Uh, a little family curse, maybe, maybe. Uh, a little hide and go seek is the, the biggest chunk of it, which like, were you good at hide and go seek as a kid? And were there enough kids hmm. around to really play it? I don't think I was that good. No. Oh. I mean, I was okay. I don't remember ever standing out for hide, my hide and seek skills. Were you scared when you were hiding? No. Like, like when I was playing hide and go seek, we often played uh, it. I don't think I was patient enough. That I think would make I, would, sense. I would be impatient and I would try to move to a different place and get caught. That sounds like you. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. When you were hiding, though, would you ever be scared about like seeing something or hearing something that you? <clears throat> yeah, I think I was actually. You were? Yes. Oh, scary cat. Well, well, like if, like if I chose to, like hide in a closet, yeah. and then I would shut. You know, you want to like shut the door, and, mm-hmm. like classic hiding spot. Little kid, just like go in the closet, and <laughs> it is kind of funny. Like everyone having the same idea. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, go go into the closet and then hide behind the clothes. Because like when I would mm-hmm. play with Kyler Monroe when they were younger, it's like it's a go to, and yeah. then they're always like so surprised. I would find them. I was like, yeah, it's, it's the first place people go, and then I would like <laughs> eventually, of course, like wait and look around other places knowing that they were there. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't just like ruin the game for your kids, would you? No. You're not no, no, a monster, no, are not you? Not a monster. But, but if I, um, when I was a kid, I do remember being in there and it taking a while for someone to find me. Yeah. And almost getting to the point where you wanted to be found. Because mm. I'm like, I don't like it in here. Yeah. I have a great deal of patience. <laughs> so yeah. 
I, if I hid in a closet, there were a couple closets in our house. And there was one that was particularly creepy, but for some reason didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. But I knew my brother wouldn't come down there because he was creeped out by it. It was oh. like downstairs by the furnace. It was just like where my mom would store. It was like where her old wedding dress was and yeah. old coats. Like I don't even know uh. why we had the crap we had in that closet. And it had slider doors as opposed to uh -huh. uh, like hinged doors. Yeah. And I would go in there and it smelled like cedar. And I, don't, I would like fall asleep. I was just like, I didn't care. I would Funny. wait it out. Okay. And You're I was never dedicated. Yes. I was never scared. But when I would get scared is when I would leave the closet and try to book it upstairs. Then I was certain something was going was to right get me going you. up the stairs. Yep. I know, what is that? It's what some, a specific fear that we all have because you see it in so many movies. Yeah, when you start running up the stairs, you're uh, afraid that something's right behind you. Or in movies, they put something right behind you. Yeah. It's, it's the same. It's like the same part of the brain gets activated as when you are like swimming towards shore. And you think that like, for me, and I think that certain other people, where you think something's about to come get you in the water. Oh, I and don't And then like that. the faster you're swimming, that you just picture this thing speeding up behind you. Oh. And you have to make it to shore in time to get to keep from this thing getting you. I have never had that fear. I have it often in the water. Well, you know that like I, I have I know to, you're like, not a strong swimmer and like the whole thing. <laughs> I'm no, not, I'm not worried about drowning. No, I'm not I'm not making fun I'm of you. I'm worried about getting monster attacked. I know. Well, and I know that like water is just yeah, a little like you didn't grow up a around a ton of water yeah. in that way. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Okay. You don't have to be upset about it. I just don't like dark water. <laughs> I know that. I know that. All right. Well, let's uh we we'll get to the hide and seek portion of the story after we have a little warm up. Okay. Why is it that the moment I want to start telling the story, I have to burp? Oh, man. So obnoxious. All right. Here we go. Hey, Dan. Hey, Lindsay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> First, I'd like to say that I really love your podcast. I have always loved being scared yes. by horror movies and all things scary. And this may be my new favorite podcast. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Anyways, I have several short tales that all kind of go together from my grandmother and myself, and hopefully it all will make sense by the end. All these stories happen in a tiny town about an hour and a half south of Indianapolis called Cornersville, Indiana. I call these stories my great-great-aunt witch. Oh, I'm sorry. I call this story my great-great-aunt witch and the ghost at grandma's house. Thelma, my grandma, was always telling me weird and supernatural things that happened to her throughout her life, but this story has always stuck with me because it was so creepy. When I asked other family members about it, they said that they remembered their parts in the exact way that she would retell it. Grandma Thelma and Grandpa Jesse had three kids, my Aunt Joyce, my mom, and my Uncle Jesse. One day, when the fair was in town, my grandpa took my mom and Aunt Joyce to the fair, and my grandma stayed home with my uncle because he was too young to ride the rides. Grandma said she had just put Jesse down for a nap and was about to do some of the girls' laundry when there was a knock on the back door. She thought it was weird, as most people came to the front door, but assumed that it was a neighbor or someone that had seen her in the back bedroom through the open windows. It was her great aunt. Grandma said that she let her in and then went back to folding her laundry while they talked. She told me that while well, she was always afraid of her great aunt because she thought she was a witch, her great aunt was mad this is so great. Her great aunt was mad because she hadn't been invited to the last family gathering that grandma and grandpa had had at their house. My grandma apologized and said that she thought she had invited her. Grandma said that the whole time they were talking, her aunt was just watching her fold the laundry until suddenly she picked up one of my aunt Joyce's shirts, laid it out on the bed where they were folding laundry, and then traced the outline of it with her finger. Then she folded it very strangely and added it to the middle of the pile of the laundry instead of the top. Then she told my grandma to make sure she was invited to the next family gathering and then she had to go. Instead of leaving through the door, she walked over to the window, then faced the backyard, turned around, waved to my grandma and went backwards out the window. <laughs> my grandma said she had been totally creeped out by my great aunt's behavior by her great aunt's behavior she waited until she had walked across the backyard to the alley behind the house and had disappeared around the corner and then she went through the pile of clothes until she found the shirt in the middle she pulled it out unfolded it shook it out a few times and then folded it normally and added it to the top of the pile and went on with her day keeping an eye out just in case her great aunt came back later that day my grandpa my mom and my aunt joyce came home from the fair my grandma was about to tell my grandpa about the weird visit when he said that he had the weirdest thing that happened to them while they were at the fair. The girls, who were about seven and five, 
had wanted to ride the merry-go-round, and so Grandpa took them over and had them each choose a horse. Mom took a yellow horse, and Joyce took a purple one. Right before the ride started, Grandpa got the strangest bad feeling about the purple horse and forced Joyce to move to a pink one. After the ride got going, there was a sudden loud noise, and the pole keeping the purple horse up broke. The entire horse fell off the ride. Then quickly, the ride shut down. None of the kids were hurt, but he kept them off rides the rest of the day, and they played games. And they played games instead. My grandma said she decided to never tell him about her great aunt's visit, despite her feelings that the broken horse was some kind of warning from her great aunt. Grandpa would never have let the great aunt back in the house if my grandma had felt threatened and she didn't want to risk it. Years later, after I was born, they still lived in that same house. My mom and dad lived right down the street and so we would stop by often to visit. I was always a quiet baby and hardly cried at all, but I would go berserk any time someone took me into that kitchen. I was too young to talk or walk, so they couldn't ask me what was wrong, but I am told I would always point at the back door and cry. My grandma told me that my face reminded her of that of a child who was being yelled at by a grown-up. It got so bad that my grandma, who believed in ghosts and witches and all kinds of paranormal things, finally convinced my grandpa to move to a better part of town and rent out that house for additional income. She knew he would never move for a possible ghost yelling at me. <laughs> she never. She said I never had any problems visiting them after that. Now fast forward, I'm about 10 years old. My parents are working a lot, so I stay with my grandparents after school and on the weekends. My grandparents' house is a one-story house with a basement, but the house is on a sloping hill. If you look at it from the street, you can only see the main level, but if you are looking from the backyard, you can see the windows of the basement, and it looks like it's a two-story house. On the side of the house where it slopes, where it slopes down, there are tiny windows that look into the laundry room, and on the back side of the house there is a lo- a huge row of windows looking into what is essentially a secondary living room in the basement. I've always been kind of creeped out by basements in general, but I would still play in this one from time to time with my cousins or my friends. The way the basement is set up is you come down the stairs and you're in an in a huge open living room that takes up the whole right side of the basement. On the left side of the basement was a door that led to a bedroom that my older brother stayed in, a small room with a square table and a shelf full of board games and cards, and the laundry room at the other end. One day I was in the basement watching TV in the living room while my grandma was in the other room doing laundry, when out of the corner of my eye I saw something through the huge windows on the right side of the room. My grandparents lived in a nice neighborhood and we'd never had any problems with the neighbors or anyone walking through our yard. But there, in the middle of our yard, was a man in a long black coat with a black hat staring at me. He had a huge black dog on a leash, too. They were just out there, not moving at all, staring through the windows directly at me. I knew all the neighbors and this definitely wasn't one of them. I could see the man's face because the sun was behind his he- I couldn't see the man's face because the sun was behind his head and his hat was blocking it out. And even though I could see the entire yard because of the windows, I had somehow not seen them walk into the yard. I figured I'd been too busy watching TV and hadn't noticed, but looking back upon it, I for sure should have seen them walk up into the yard. From behind me, I heard my grandma close the lid to the washing machine and briefly looked away. As soon as I turned my head back around, the man and the dog were gone. Impossible. I had not looked away long enough for them to disappear behind the house, and there weren't any big trees or anything in the backyard to hide behind. Just a huge open yard. I got up quickly and backed away from the windows towards the door that led to the laundry room. Grandma came into the living room with her basket to head back upstairs and saw me backed up against a wall, staring out the windows. She asked me what was wrong. Frozen in fear, I couldn't stop staring into the backyard. She exchanged glances between me and the window, and for a brief moment before setting down her basket, she put it on the bottom stairs and said to me, Did you see the man with the dog? (laughs) I expected her to tell me something like, Oh, we got new neighbors, and I forgot to tell you. But instead, she said, I've seen him before, too. He's always just staring through the windows from the middle of the yard. I've never seen him move, but any time I look away for more than a second, he disappears. I described him to your grandpa, and he said that no one fitting that description lives around here. I was totally freaked out. My grandma said that if I ever saw anything else like that and no one else could see it but me, I could always talk to her about it, and she would always believe me. I did continue to see him from time to time. I never saw him from outside the house, though, just from inside the basement. He always stood there, unmoving, looking in the windows. 
He didn't seem menacing, and after the first experience rattled me, I soon moved on from it. My grandma told me once that she thought he might be protecting her from something, but she just wasn't quite sure. At the time, though, I couldn't think of anything scarier than him, and I didn't want to either. A few weeks after I saw him that first time, I was playing hide-and-seek with some friends of mine that lived in the neighborhood when I decided that I was tired of being the first one found, so I went inside and hid in the basement. From the main floor of the house, you could get into the basement two ways. There was a door in the kitchen that led into a small mudroom at the top of the stairs, or there was a door in the garage that led to the same mudroom. You could come into the basement easily from the back or front of the house. We always started our game on the front porch of the house and then ran off to hide. Whomever was it always had to stand and count while facing the front door so you couldn't see where anyone else went. I ran off the porch and into the garage as quiet as I could, ran into the mudroom, executing my plans to make it to the basement and not be found. My plan was to watch out the windows until everyone was found but me. I saw a few of my friends hiding behind bushes and small trees in the back, but I didn't want to get caught cheating, so I kind of halfway hid behind the doorway that led to the laundry room. I was watching all my friends in the backyard. I could account for each and every one of them when I suddenly heard a tapping on the laundry room window. The window in the laundry room was really, really small. You could probably cover it up with an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It's just there to get a little light into the laundry room. It's also up way high on the wall, almost to the ceiling. There's mm -hmm. nothing under that window obstructing the view. On the exterior of the house, the window is almost at ground level because it's on a sloping hillside of the house. You can only see the feet of people walking or running past the window. I thought maybe when I heard the tapping, it was my grandma or grandpa trying to get my attention, though that was unlikely as they were very old and they would have had to practically lie on the ground to look into the window. And because I could clearly see all of my friends in the backyard, I knew it wasn't any of them. I turned to investigate what it could be and was instantly terrified. A face looking in the window with a crazed smile that was almost too wide to be real was staring at me. I ran out of there, back up the stairs, and as I was running through the doorway, I saw the man with the dog in the yard. And this time, the dog wasn't just sitting there. He was jumping at the end of his leash that the man had him on and was barking loud and crazy. The man had not been there before. Where did he come from? I didn't stop running, though. I booked it up those stairs as fast as I could. I wanted to get to my friends and ask them if they had seen or heard the man and the dog. But first, no matter how scared I was, I had to creep around the side of the house to see if anyone was lying on the ground outside the laundry room window. I slowly peeked around the side of the house. I saw nothing. I was both relieved, but somehow more terrified. I made my way towards all my friends, they were all there, no one missing. No one was missing. And just as I was passing the window, I heard the tapping sound again. I froze instantly. I slowly turned my head, and there was the face again, only this time it was inside the house. I was, it was waving mm. at me with both hands. I ran away from the window as fast as I could and told my friends what had happened. They, of course, looked at me like I was crazy and told me not only had there not been a man or a dog in the backyard, they hadn't heard any barking, and they had, of course, been there the whole time. They talked me into going back into the basement to show them the window. I took them down there and pointed to the window and explained it all again. I could tell none of them believed me at all. One of the boys, who was a couple years older than me, looked at me, then studied the window for a minute, and then walked over to it and turned to me and said, you said whoever it was waved at you with both hands, right? I said, yeah. And he replied, not possible. No one is that tall. As soon as he said it, I grew even more terrified. He was standing under the window, and even though he was the tallest in the group, the window was still a good five feet above his head. There was nothing in that room that anyone could have stood on to get their eyes level with that window. I was done playing for the day and I sent all of my friends home. I was too freaked out to go back into the basement for at least a month. From then on, anytime I was in the basement at my grandma's house, I always went back upstairs if the man and the dog appeared, fearing that that horrifying face would come back too. I never went back into that laundry room ever again. And to this day, no matter who I tell this story to, no one has ever believed me except my grandma. Thanks for listening. Keep it creepy. Amy. Amy. Well, I guess, I mean, it makes sense that her grandma would believe her because her grandma is the one also seeing things and not, and not, and not just seeing things, seeing the same things. Right. Uh, that, that face at the end, like the <gasps> last one, I mean, there was a lot of things that were creeping there, obviously like the, 
the what great aunt witch you know figure what, or, or what early. a weird thing why is she folding this shirt <laughs> but you know what I thought about that some kind of hex or I don't know what the hell what what Amy didn't clarify but I think what was probably happening is she was folding something the, into the the grandma was folding the laundry of her two daughters right the boy was home and so was she folding the shirt of Aunt Joyce who had picked the purple horse and that's the horse that broke. Like, was it, like, right, this weird, right. like, telepathic spell? And somehow the grandpa, like, picked know. up on this, like, weird energy. And, like, you know, just that gut instinct of, like, that's not safe. Yeah. And just so— Because yeah. to me, that's where it started. Right, right. And then that very specific, like, exit, like, which is so— uh, that And, I mean, it's kind of funny, but also, if done in a creepy way, uh -huh. that would freak me out. If, if some, like, weird aunt who you already think is just, like, there's something creepy about her. Right. And then she comes in, and then facing you, backs out of a window, and then I think also said, like, right, like, backs up off the property. Yeah, yeah. That is crazy. It's weird. Uh-huh. Like, um, like if that person was blatantly mentally ill, then it would just be like, okay, that's sad. But that wasn't mentioned. And mm -mm. so, if, like, if they're normally kind of normal and then do something so specific, I'm like, what did you just do? Well, and she feels very petty. Like, oh, you didn't invite me to this family function. Right. It's like, oh, boy. But the creepiest part was the end. The second time she saw the face with that was too like the smile was too wide mm -hmm. inside the window I know so I'm picture I'm picturing and I think I can picture that kind of window where it's like me a little too, re me rectangle right yeah like and, a, and, it's not an egress window it's like a storm window I forget what I don't they know call what they're those called, but I know I've, I've been in a million rooms those, like, those. Mm -hmm. like old school they would be like a glass block window but now they're like long and thin yes exactly you know what? yeah yeah, it'd be like, okay, we had one that was, before we had the concrete pour, that like under the deck in the back. Like, so in the family room, there was that little window. Like, if we're looking at our TV mm -hmm. uh, downstairs, there was yes, that. Yes, okay. yes, 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 If that was a different shape, if yeah, it yeah, was yeah. like more of a rectangle and it's close I'm, to the ground on top. I love how we're explaining something that no one else has I, seen. I know, yeah, but like, yeah. Trust us. <laughs> it's a window up high. Yeah. And it was like. You know, I I don't even know the purpose High of that window. High on the interior wall, yeah. but outside, you would have to lay on the ground to have your face be level with it. Like, mm -hmm. it's right on the ground. What is the purpose of a window like that? Um, Sometimes they're for, like, fire escape or that one's different, so like, tiny. stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways. Uh, anyways, um, but just to, like, so, A, so creepy to see somebody that would have to be, like, yeah, like, laying down. But then, yeah. And then so much creepier to, like, those windows, it doesn't sound like that window was one that would... Norm, open, but open properly. Even so, if it did, no one could fit through it based on the yeah, description. So thin, and so it's like to have something coming through that and like waving with its hands. It's like, <sighs> like, like it's just such a weird, disturbing visual. And have the grandma believe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was like piecing it all together. So like you know, the aunt does this. I you know this curse. That's what I think. Yeah. And then I think as a result, you know, they, okay, so they leave. So, well, actually, Amy's a baby. Every time she is in that kitchen, she's screaming, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So it's and like- this, And the same part of it, looking at the same area of the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That like- that There's something there. Mm -hmm. So now they've moved houses and now they're in this new house. And the grandma sees the man. Initially, I thought like, oh shit, I've never seen Hat Man with a dog. Yeah, 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 that yeah. That felt uncomfortable. Ugh. But they both mm -hmm. say that- they, it never felt menacing. So I'm like, wait, did you, are you in protection of the curse that the great aunt put on the, the little family or whatever? Like, that's interesting. And then, okay, so now they both see the man and the man seems to keep them safe. Does the smiley man and mm -hmm. the hat man, do they have some sort of beef? And so it's like, when when Amy's saying like, I was scared to see the, the black hat man ever again because I didn't know if that meant I would also see the smiley face guy. Yeah. So it then just feels like a weird thing, like just like all like interwoven. So I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I will admit that like witch type stuff makes me more skeptical than normal, even because of the history of like you know uh, witch burnings and stuff, and it's just mm -hmm. people who are not of the same religion or whatever. It's just mm -hmm. like, but uh, but not, but now I think about that curse story we told a few weeks yep. ago, where the guy died in Seattle and is found dead in his bathtub and mm -hmm. was hearing the noises and seeing things building up, and you're gonna die in a week and then dies in a week and all that. Just the possibility of that is so horrible. Yeah, we that, got that you could piss off the wrong person and they could literally curse you. Yeah, we got uh, an email from a practicing witch after that story, and there, it wasn't even that they thought it wasn't plausible yeah they were just like man that's like a petty person that most people who, who <laughs> yeah, practice yeah. witchcraft that's sure. not something most people would do which, would which gave not. me some sort of peace i was like <laughs> man i am sure i have pissed off people in my life but the but the possibility that that could be real i hate so much should i, I threaten to curse you when you irritate me well you're not a witch that um, you know of no nah, i know about it <laughs> there's, there's so much you don't know about me yeah mm -hmm. oh man you, what's my shoe size you're making 
I don't care about those details. You're, I would, <laughs> let me guess. Eight. Nope. Six. <laughs> seven. Nine. <laughs> you can't just start screaming numbers out. That's how guessing works. <laughs> no, you're just, you didn't even give me a chance to reply. You said eight. I said no. And, and then I said you, seven. And then you started going, no, then you said six. Six. And then, and then you started going crazy with your numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Which eight. is it? I am an eight and a half, but mostly a oh, nine. Oh, man, I was so close when I started. I know, but, I, but I'm more of a nine now. Do you know your feet never stop growing? Mm, I didn't know that. I just made that up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty fun. Now, now, yeah, that is pretty ridiculous. I, I die that, with the, huge feet, clown I'm, feet. I'm just picturing like at a senior center, like everyone has clown feet. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's actually why they have to be in wheelchairs so they don't trip over their own two feet. It's not because their bones are right. failing and it's just clown feet. Oh my god, clown feet and black eyed children is mine. <laughs> oh my god, that is so funny to me. Oh, see, but when, like I was saying, there's so much you don't know about me. <laughs> <laughs> you want to? Uh, you want to thank some of uh, some of our Annabelles? I do, Dan. Thanks you, for asking. You start or me start? Me start. Okay. Okay. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for helping us donate. Uh, this month, Noah Thompson, Devin, Skylar Nyberg, Emily Songer, Huggy Bear, Huggy Bear, Huggy Bear, Katie, Shawan Duplissy, du- Duplissy, uh, Sylvia or- Orozco, Sylvia Orozco, Joshua Fink, Megalodon and Viper, <laughs> Deborah Cassidy, Tracy Slack. You getting a good kick out of yeah, that one? That's funny. Colin Sewell. Uh, Sewell, Krista Brown, Rose Turong, Alex Brown, the one who, oh boy, I think I forgot a letter. The one who forgets. I wrote Fogets. Oh yeah, yeah. The one who forgets. Uh, Wolf, your friendly neighborhood power bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Essington, Neil V, Jess Farnsworth, Renissa Weiss, Jennifer Williams, Tori Campbell, and Lindsay Laveau. I will thank all of you for helping us do this show and and uh, be able to give to charity as well. And I want to thank the following Annabelle's Erica Tucker, Carissa Zelko, Barry, Adrian Enriquez, Jasmine Monreal, Heather Lynn, Jordan Delahunty, Daniel Brown, Son of Dick. Love that one. I wish it was Son of a Dick. <laughs> I kind of like Son of Dick. <laughs> uh, Zach Fitzpatrick. Are you I- Richard's son? Yes, I am <laughs> Son of Dick. Exactly. Zach, uh, yeah, Zach Fitzpatrick, Hez, Tiffany Becker, Kimberly Mori, Kobe Collins, Cassie Quam, and thank you, Cassie, for the Norwegian phonetic kind of guide with your name. I was really tempted not to give it to him. <laughs> Natalie or Ordin- Natalie or Dinnens, Rachel Zimmerman, Heather Thompson, Mark Zawa Sostak, Hannah F, Jacob De Pal- Palati, Chrissy Lambert, Katrina Majors. Spatulas 666. <laughs> That's a really funny one to me. That's just such a random um, hybrid. Spatulas and 666. It's the devil's spatula. <laughs> the devil's spatulas. Satan's spatulas. And uh, three shots in. I know. I love it. They were fun mm-hmm. ones this week. Mm-hmm. And I just have just a few Annabelle sh- or, um, spoopy uh, shout outs. Spoopy shout outs this week. To- Get your spoop together. Yo, bruh. Okay. From Kat to Tyler, you're my favorite peeper. Hang in there. It will get better. To Susie Q from Vinny, we're here for you. And to Freckles from Shadow. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Freckles and Shadow. (laughs) So excited to raise our daughter together. Congrats to us. Freckles and Shadow, what is their daughter going to do? That's exactly, what's the daughter's name if you you got Freckles? Well, she's not born yet. Right. Or he, yeah, our daughter. And she's not born yet. They were expecting i think that um i forget uh shadow submitted it and i think that by the time we recorded this there was the hope that the baby would be here freckles shadow and baby tan line (laughs) i don't know why that popped in my head (laughs) (laughs) no one's nickname is tan line (laughs) maybe there's a lot of nicknames out there uh and that's our (laughs) that's pretty funny to me to have a baby nickname tan line like why is the baby going tanning uh that's our show for this week Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Liz Hernandez for their work on social media and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to uh, Logan Keith for producing and directing today. Woohoo! Logan in the house. Mm-hmm. Zach Paisley supervising him. Zach Paisley? Oh my God. <laughs> 
Why did I do that? Joe Pace is surprised. You know what? Because I was getting ready to read Zach Cohen. <laughs> I know. This uh, is so great. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Uh, book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number three. Uh, I, again, uh, found the first story I told today, like last week. Uh, Sophie Evans found the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to hear and watch us. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content at Scared to Death Podcast. There's pics that accompany each episode's stories. Uh, we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, for fun people who uh, also are horror lovers. Thanks to Liz Hernandez for moderating. And if you don't want to hear any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon and get the entire catalog ad-free and much more. And as always, greatly appreciate the ratings and reviews lately, Creeps and Peepers. They help us find new listeners and are very, very much appreciated. Uh, and finally, thanks to Baby Tanline, just for, you know, being a cool baby. I have, well, now if they don't call their Baby Tanline, that's it. Like, you guys can't even, you're not even allowed to listen to our show anymore. You have to go away. I just, it was like, I was over here dying, like, really trying to hold my laughter in, because then I was having these visions of, like, Baby Tanline not liking their nickname, and then, like, going outside and tanning without their diaper on. Oh my God. <laughs> baby Tanline doing some nude sunbathing to get rid of the tan line. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, beepers, and baby tan lines. <laughs> I hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions.